Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Kevin Emmerich. He's a biologist and former National Park Ranger. Uh, he co-founded a conservation organization, Basin and Range Watch, that works toward preserving the last non-destroyed regions of California and Nevada deserts. So, first off, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program again. Well, thank you for inviting me, and thanks for your interest in this particular issue, because we're not getting a lot from, from some other folks. Well, let's talk about what this issue is. I presume we're talking about the Gemini Solar Project? Yes, we are. Yeah, so, so tell us what it is and what's wrong with it. Okay, so the Gemini Solar Project would be one of the largest photovoltaic energy projects um, ever built on Bureau of Land Management land, and that's land managed by the Department of the Interior. And it's in the state of Nevada, in southern Nevada, in Clark County. And um, that's federal land, so that's publicly owned land. And um, it would be in the Mojave Desert region, the biological region known as the Mojave Desert. And I guess it's approximate elevation of 2,000 to 2,500 feet or so. And um, it would be the, one of the largest, if not the largest, um, solar project ever approved on public lands in the desert. It would be 7,100 acres, and um, that equates to about 11 square miles. And it would be essentially... Um, with that many acres, it would have to be millions of solar panels that would be placed in the desert um, over what is now, um, from from our research anyway, and from what we're looking at, a very valuable um, Mojave Desert habitat because it supports a, a number of different species. Um, the project would um, have what they call single-axis tracking, so... That means the solar panels would move with the sun to get the optimal amount of energy. And um, it would have a storage element, and that means it would have a um, building that would be full of, um, I believe they would be lithium-ion batteries that would actually store the power, theoretically, for a number of hours. Um, it would be possibly for after when the sun goes down and they could actually keep the grid going. Um, and it would also be for time to peak overload, sort of when there's a lot of energy being fed into the grid and they sometimes end up curtailing solar projects. They end up firing up the batteries to keep things a little bit stable. Um, ironically, the batteries would have to be um, cooled by air conditioners <laughs> powered by the solar panels. And when you think about where this would be, um, in the summertime, the temperatures out there can get up to, I guess, 110 to 115 degrees. And even in the nighttime, those temperatures are going to be warm, and so you need to keep those, those batteries cool. And so it's going to require um, a significant amount of electricity just to, to use the air conditioning, the HVAC, in order to cool it. Um, so, um, you know, moving on with this project, uh, as far as the environmental um, issues, there's just a whole number of them. And I guess what I'll do is I'll start with uh, maybe the visual impact, simply because um, it'll help people recognize where this is. Um, it would be built um, on the Valley of Fire Road, and in Nevada, that's the entrance road to the first state park ever established in Nevada. It's called Valley of Fire, and it actually preserves a lot of very unique, well, southern Utah-like red sandstone formations, and it's actually become pretty popular um, the entrance road goes through um, what would be the project site and through an area called the Muddy Mountains, and that's a wilderness area, and eventually into the park. Um, this 10-square-mile project would be so visible. Um, 
if you think about how big that is, I mean, you can literally stand on one end of the project and not see the horizon for what it was. It would just simply be a monotone view of solar panels, just to give folks an idea of how large that would be. Um, so that's going to turn what is a, a real scenic area in Nevada into a very industrial looking zone. Um, so they, the Bureau of Land Management manages land through their visual um, classes. And this particular area has a higher visual class because of its location. And so in order to approve this project, the BOM has to change their definition to visual resource management class four, which is the lowest possible class, which you can essentially do anything, dig up anything, that sort of thing. So that will be very noticeable to a lot of people. Um, on the cultural resources, this is not far from the Moapa Indian Reservation. And I do know that several of the Moapa have expressed concerns about actual um, archaeology sites being dug up and destroyed from this project or just crushed and run over. So that's another aspect. There's a, also a historic trail called the Old Spanish Trail, which is famous as a an old ancient or ancient but very old historic trade route through Native Americans and settlers, and it's actually protected by the National Park Service. But about three miles of that would be converted into these industrial solar panels, and so. That's another um, this big issue. But one of the issues that we're really upset about here and we're really concerned about is the biological diversity of, of the area. And so this happens to have a really um, high-density population of desert tortoise. And as people who are familiar with the Mojave Desert know, that's a federally threatened species um, listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And um, they would essentially need to, um, because they're protected, send a bunch of biologists in there and go and um, remove, they've estimated 215 adult desert tortoises and 900 juveniles. And so that's... Um, over 1,200 desert tortoises would have to be actually unearthed, dug up, and removed for this, this solar project alone. And um, that's a big number. That's actually um, a higher density than what the Fish and Wildlife Service protects in some of their recovery units in areas in the desert not far from the Gemini solar site. So. Um, that many desert tortoises were actually, approximately that many, were moved for a marine base expansion in California called the 29 Palms Marine Base. And um, they moved close to 1,200 for a 49,000 acre expansion. And when you think about that, this is 7,000 acres, and there's about that many desert tortoises on there. So, but, you know, this is a solar project, so it's green energy, right? So, um, so there, there's a lot more to that story. Um, it's not like the agencies, the Bureau of Land Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service don't know that there are a lot of desert tortoises here. Um, so they're, they're going to try to mitigate this. And so they have a preferred alternative for this project to where they're not going to just bulldoze the entire site. They would bulldoze about 2,500 acres, and the other 4,600 acres, they would use this new technique um, that they're, they're trying to sell to us, which would be mowing the vegetation down, allowing it to regrow, and then about a year later, um, allowing many of the desert tortoises that they moved off the site to re-enter the site. And they, they say that's going to work very well. And there are a lot of people that I've talked to that 
are optimistic and they're they're talking like, well, this is really great. We can actually um, create a a solar energy site and we'll have it be wildlife friendly. And so I'm actually thinking about a lot of the problems this will cause. I used to actually do um, desert tortoise biology consulting. And I've actually done surveys for the government, uh, USGS, and it's really difficult to find juvenile desert tortoises. The biologists are required to remove, dig up, and just take every desert tortoise off of the site before the vegetation is mowed. But they're going to have trouble finding the real little ones, like the hatchlings and the juveniles. And even the best ones won't find them all. And when they mow this vegetation, they're going to use 23,000-pound machine called heavy-duty mulchers. And these essentially have these large, um, I don't know what you would call them, shredders on on the front of them, and they, they turn every plant and everything in their path into mulch, and they're just big shredders. On that site, there are some large cacti, there are Mojave yucca, but there's also what we call microfill woodland, where there's cat claw acacia and desert willow, and they are growing in a lot of the washes, and they're habitat for a lot of birds, and they essentially send their roots down really deep to get what water accumulates at the bottom of the washes. All of those are going to get shredded and, and destroyed by these mulchers. Um, equally, every creosote bush, every other plant that, that's living on that site will also be shredded and mowed down. And um, we've seen this before. Um, there's a, another solar project. It's located not too far from the Gemini site. It's called the Perump Solar Project, and it's 80 acres. It's photovoltaic panels. Um, and 80 acres, they basically just cut down the vegetation, let it regrow a couple of years later, and then they put a bunch of solar panels within that area. And um, there are some problems with that. Like, for example, um, it shades a lot of the plants. Um, often a lot of the people who are trying to sell the idea of Gemini solar tell us, well, desert tortoises are going to utilize the shade of this solar project. And there's a truth to that. There's actually a truth to that because desert tortoises, as a lot of biologists will know when it's hot, they'll, they'll go under your car tires, and you're supposed to look under that. So if you turn your car on and you start it and you start driving away, you don't run over one. But tortoises also really depend on the sun during the springtime and during the late winter when they come out of hibernation. So... When you shade most of the habitat like that, you're really making the habitat very much less functional. Another thing that happens is after you completely um, run over a habitat and disturb it, is you get the invasive weeds moving in. Um, and those would be red brome grass. Uh, those are cheat grasses. There, those would also be... Um, schismus grass, um, erodium, Russian thistle. And while tortoises eat some of these species, um, they've been studied and they're, they're known to be much less nutritious. And it was kind of a wet year last year, and we surveyed the Perump Solar Project where they put the solar panels. And indeed, all of the new vegetation, the annuals, were um, just weeds basically coming up. Um, the creosote, the, the perennials, starts to stump sprout, so some of those do grow back after they mow the vegetation. But um, they tend to not be as abundant when they're shaded so much, because plants actually do need a lot of shade. So, <laughs> I mean, there's a, so many details to this. It's, they've never tried this before, where they've actually moved that many desert tortoises and then allow them to re-enter the site. So what they'll do is they'll dig them up, they'll move them, and some of them they'll just relocate over the fence. And then they're going to allow some of the vegetation to regrow on the site for a year. And 
tortoises generally will return to a site when they're um, moved from it. Um, on other solar project sites where they don't mow the project, they just don't allow any of the animals to come back on the site. And so they've had mortalities with desert tortoise that, that they basically um, pace the fence that keeps them out, and some of them overheat and die because they're reptiles. They can't thermoregulate their temperature. So the theory is, is well, they allow them to re-enter this site, um, the tortoises are moving around in there amongst the solar panels. But what we're saying is, well, you're really degrading the habitat. And um, and they're trying to do this on a really massive scale. And so we're, we're concerned about that, obviously. Um, I could go on about tortoises, but there's other issues here. Um, this is... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Before we, before we go on to other issues, this... I mean, honestly, is is the way you're describing this, and what I've read about this with these twenty thousand pound mulchers, I I don't understand how anybody. I mean, honestly, if desert tortoises wanted to live in essentially gravel lots that have some weeds growing, they would move to a parking lot. I mean, the the the, the tortoises would be there if they wanted to be there. The tortoises are where they want to be. It's just this seems like such incredible nonsense to I don't know it, it this this sounds like a line from the uh uh God who said this um Lao Tzu, I think um the more talking and thinking, the farther from the truth it's just this this seems like a whole bunch of words. I can't believe here's what I'm trying to say this is just honest I can't believe anybody's stupid enough to think that if you mow down the habitat, you put in a bunch of solar panels, then it's going to be just as good a habitat. That's just one of the right. stupidest ideas I've ever heard in my life. And you know, the, the You don't desert, have to agree with that. It's just, it just seems incredibly stupid No, I, I stupid agree with it. I think it's really fucking stupid, to be honest with you. I'm sorry, I just had to say that. But the desert tortoise is actually not doing that well um, in, in the Mojave Desert. Um, we went to a, a large meeting Fish and Wildlife Service had, and they put some of the numbers out in the western part of the Mojave Desert. They're just seeing the populations crash. Lots of reasons, um, lots of fragmentation from housing developments, um, too much off-roading. Some of the areas are overgrazed. A lot of reasons. Um, to the northwest, um, Saint or the northeast near Saint George, Utah more development but you know the developers want to fragment one of their last remaining habitats with a large super highway and they're working on that right now they're introducing those bills they're having congress introduce those bills now and so that it's really dangerous um las vegas nevada just won't stop growing and las vegas is building um it just has thousands of people moving in per month and uh, it, it's growing so fast that the county is requesting Congress to dispose of about 50,000 acres or 60,000 acres of additional land. And most of that happens to be desert tortoise habitat. So here we have these people that want to build a solar project on an area where they've determined that the habitat is actually doing well. And those numbers kind of tell you that it is when you've got that high density there, that that habitat is actually doing really good compared to the ones that are crashing. And so the the big thing is, well, don't don't try to fix what isn't broken. Put those solar panels somewhere else, or you know, find an, another way to get energy. But you know, that's another argument there. Or maybe reduce energy usage altogether. Yeah, yeah. Which is never um, on the table. Yeah, there, I mean, there's some additional things about this habitat it's, that I just want to point out. It's It's got some very rare plants growing on it as well. And Laura and I actually petitioned to list to the Fish and Wildlife Service an endangered one called the three-corner milk vetch, which has one of the smallest habitat, or the smallest known habitat distributions in the state of Nevada. And this project will destroy 700 acres of the habitat. 
they're trying to mitigate it. They're going to say, well, we'll keep the invasive weeds from growing out after we put the solar panels over it. And I said, well, how will you do that? Well, we're going to use herbicides. I say, well, how are the natives going to grow after you use herbicides? And they don't really have, you know, they're not going to answer that question. But essentially, their review says they're going to sacrifice 700 acres of the habitat for a small annual plant. When you think of an annual plant, it's just tiny like that. 700 acres is a significant portion. And um, we've asked them, could you at least move the project out of that habitat? And they just are not even open to that. Um, we think the reason for them not wanting to move anything is um, the project's already made a really cushy deal with the main utility in southern Nevada, Nevada called Nevada Envy Energy. And Envy Energy signed a contract to buy 690 megawatts of power from Gemini Solar. And that's a specific number, and because of that, the, the developer doesn't want to move it and therefore the Bureau of Land Management, they're kind of kissing their asses and they're not really making them move it. So that creates other problems, of course. And, you know, this isn't about the desert tortoise only. The desert tortoise is the, one of the few species that's protected. Um, there just happens to be a whole um, ecosystem out there that's going to be destroyed when they run 23,000 pound vehicles over it. And those include kangaroo rats, desert iguanas, desert horn lizards, tarantulas, kit foxes, American badgers, burrowing owls. I mean, the list really goes on and on. We also um, are talking to some soil experts and running the vehicles that heavy over plants, the plants will start to regrow, but when, when when you have that much damage and you have that much repeated running over, you start to kill a lot of the root systems, and a lot of those are really ancient, and a lot of those have a lot of mycorrhizae bacteria, and a lot of that sequesters carbon. Um, a lot of these deserts are, are carbon sinks, and we, we read a lot about we need to save trees for climate change, which is a good idea, but a lot of people don't understand that in deserts we have these these plants that are adapted to storing CO2. We have biological soil crusts on the ground that are thousands of years old that are experts in a way of storing CO2. And then we have these complex root systems of, of all the desert plants out there that equally have these capabilities as well. And so when we disturb it like that, we start releasing CO2 in the air, and we also take away an ecosystem's functional ability to, to help mitigate the effects of climate change. And I think it's really important that people start to see that. When you industrialize an area to save climate change, you're really not helping when you do it like that. You're actually probably adding to the problem. So there, there are plenty of reasons <laughs> to um, be alarmed about a solar project this big. What's a little bit um, alarming to me in getting back to this desert tortoise issue is that because we feel that a lot of these desert tortoises will re-enter the site, there will be a lot of, um, well, public relations saying that this was a success. And um, tortoises are a really long-lived animal, and so calling success right away like that is, is sort of a dangerous and unscientific thing to do. And so you're degrading the habitat. It doesn't necessarily mean that tortoises are going to do very well just because they re-enter the site and survived there for a while. And um, we think that that's probably going to set a precedent for um, other developers who want to build solar projects, especially in the Nevada desert. Um, and I say that because the state of Nevada, um, I guess it was March or April, passed legislation 
that requires utilities to get 50% of their um, energy from renewables. And that's wind, you know, solar and geothermal. Um, that entire bill left out the build environment for renewables and, and located in the build environment. And that bill left out all energy efficiency. And so it creates a demand for the desert lands throughout Nevada. And um, I'm looking at a lot of different applications for different solar projects that are popping up now. Um, most likely because that legislation passed. And a lot of these guys are looking for a way to, to look green publicly and saying that we found a solution for the desert tortoise by mowing the vegetation and allowing the tortoises to re-enter the site might actually be a technique that a lot of them are going to try to pull now. So that's what's kind of alarming about the, the Gemini solar project. Not that the other ones that, that we've looked at are not alarming, it's just that this one is, they're, they're, they're starting to call that kind of a win-win a situation, and we think that's dangerous, definitely. So. You know, anytime industry says something's a win-win, you know that they're lying. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I have fought the timber industry for 30 years now, and 28 years, whatever, and when they come up with a win-win, it, the environment always loses. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just they've come up with a new accounting method to a new accounting method that makes a new public relations campaign. I want to go a different direction for just a second. You mentioned the biological soil crust, and um, I think a lot of people, when they think of the desert, and frankly, I mean, I lived in northeastern Nevada for a couple of years. So when I think of the desert. We think of a desert, you know, we don't really think of, I'm sitting here looking out the window at a redwood forest, and I know that this is fecund. I know that this is just full of life. And I found the desert beautiful, but it's not my place. And so can you help listeners to fall in love with the life of the desert? And can you start with the soil crusts that are these amazing communities people might not ever have thought about yeah yeah soil crusts are quite amazing because they're uh, they, well first off they're pretty well known in utah i think anybody who's visited some of the southern utah national parks have probably seen signs that that talk about staying on the trail for that reason and um, they do get kind of visible in Utah, but what people don't really get is that they're pretty abundant through a lot, throughout a lot of desert areas, and there's a whole bunch of different types of them, and they're, they're lichens, they're algae, um, they're mosses, um, they're just a, a whole bunch of different types of organisms that sort of work together to create um, stable, living soil crusts that actually fixate nitrogen, um, that actually um, keep the natives stable. I, it seems like when I see soil crust disturbed, I immediately see problems with invasive weeds, number one, and, and large plumes of dust blowing just endlessly whenever the wind blows. So soil crusts are, are not only um, excellent um, as far as providing nutrients to other species in the desert, but they're um, really important soil stabilizers. And those stabilizers are, are really important in um, keeping the desert clear of all of this dust. I can't tell you how many times I've visited a new development or a recent off-road race or a solar project that's been developed in any time the wind blows, are just massive, huge dust devils. And that's largely because they're taking away a lot of that, that living crust. It just doesn't have a lot of water. But it's, it's so delicate that you can step on it and you can just basically remove it. It takes about, for some of the species of it or clusters of it, it takes about 100 years just to grow a centimeter. So yeah, it is pretty amazing. Um, I think when a lot of people look at the Gemini solar project site, 
um, they're not going to immediately get um, upset about it because it doesn't have very large Joshua trees on it like some of the other sites. But that's because they don't really get out there and take a look at how many other plants are out there. There's quite a, a large diversity of plants in the Mojave Desert. I think I've got like a botanist friend who who says that the amount of annual plants that they know of in the Mojave Desert is actually richer than that of the redwoods. No offense to the redwoods, of course. But it's actually kind of interesting that um, it's just not as visible and it's not as striking to a lot of people when they look at it right away. But when you get a, a really um, old soil crust, you'll tend to find um, the creosote bush growing in what look like big rings and those are basically all one connected plant. And they found one of those in the West Mojave Desert and they named it King Clone and it's 12,000 years old. And so so that habitat out there is actually really old. It's really stable, and it's really important. And it, um, it's the, the creosote clones, for example, really hold the soil underground together. And so a lot of the burrowing animals, like the desert tortoise, the kit fox, or the badger, can actually create a pretty complex structure of burrows because there's actually such an old growth um, desert out there. We do like to call it old growth Mojave Desert because that term often has been used so many times for um, old trees and conifer trees, but it really does apply to the desert as well. And we're not the first people to say it, and hopefully we won't be the last. <laughs> so if you have um, a soil crust that stepping on it can can harm it and uh, can take you know grow as slowly as it does I can't see why that would be injured at all by having a 20,000 pound mulcher go over the top of it and shred and crush everything there and I don't know what the problem is exactly and when you just say that the shrubs will grow back someday you're you're actually um when when they say the shrubs will grow back someday they're actually neglecting the fact that it's going to take that entire ecosystem probably a century or more to retain that old growth system that i was just talking about and so it, it's really a scam to say that we've seen them do it i mean and in, in all honesty, it's slightly better than the the former technique of just completely obliterating all the habitat, bulldozing it away, and then keeping it clear. But but at the same time, this is a whole new set of impacts, and it's hardly a good trade-off. I mean, it's hardly a compensation. So, so, so um, I, I I'm going to ask a question to which I don't know the answer at all. But I know that gopher tortoises in the American Southeast are hugely important to, oh gosh, I think it's like 20 species. They effectively act like prairie dogs on the East Coast. That the gopher tortoises, uh, they dig the burrows and then everybody uses the burrows. Owls, all sorts of creatures who can't dig on their own. And so gopher tortoises in the Southeast are often called a keystone species. And is that true or not true for desert tortoises too? Do they do a lot of creatures depend on their burrows for habitat? Oh, it's definitely true. Um, in fact, burrowing owls really depend on other animals' burrows and to uh, to populate an area. So, it's very common to have a a pretty big burrowing owl population with a big tortoise population, and they did find. Uh, quite a number of burrowing owls on the Gemini site. Um, equally, kit foxes will modify desert tortoise burrows. But um, I've often actually found snakes in using desert tortoise burrows for shade and shelter and thermoregulation. Um, equally, we've seen rodents also um, basically living in a tortoise burrow while they're hibernating. So it's very important, actually, so, yes, the tortoise has also been called a 
keystone species of the Mojave Desert. Um, and here's another question. This this is a different direction, really. That um, if if the if those biological crusts are so fragile, <clears throat> um, how come bighorn sheep don't destroy them when they walk through? Um, they generally don't have really big feet, big hooves, and they also, um, it, this is kind of a, a guess on that, and it's actually a good question, but they, I, I don't see bighorn sheep um, taking the softest um, substrate to walk on. They tend to like to walk on the existing rocks, and, and they don't always just walk on the areas of the crust. But it's not like they don't. It's not like you won't see wildlife trails uh, through biological soil crust. And it's really common, for example, to see a trail with coyote tracks um, just traversing over soil crust. But they all tend to follow the same trail over time. They, they, they don't tend to make a whole bunch of new trails. So bighorn sheep are kind of like that. They're very routine and habitual. That's a good question, but yes, they they do have their own impact, but they're they're just not like say when they introduce like like for example when a population of exotic burros or donkeys gets in an area, they tend to walk um, more widespread around an area, and that tends to make soil crust disappear more. And equally, when they put livestock in a desert area and they just allow them to graze everywhere, that does tend to make soil crust disappear. But the native animals just have their routine down, it seems. So another another uh, tortoise question. This, I'm just curious. So um, who eats tortoises? Oh, do, the, do, well, like, do the babies get eaten a lot? I'm, I'm, yeah, like I the, interviewed somebody about sea turtles a while ago, and it was just really interesting to me. The big sea turtles are doing fine. But little sea turtles, there's like a one percent chance they make it to an adulthood. That basically, when sea turtle, when they have their babies, boom, there's like fish line up. Everybody lines up to eat them, and it's just it's like salmon coming to a river. That it's this huge explosion of food. So I'm just wondering who eats who eats tortoises. Oh, that's a yeah, good question. And most most baby tortoises apparently don't make it either. That's what that's what everyone says. They have a high mortality rate. It would be. Um, just about everything. When they're younger, they have softer shells, so they're a little more palatable to different types of snakes. And they're diurnal or daytime active, so it would have to be a lot of the diurnal snakes. But they like rattlesnakes, gopher snakes, um, just a whole series of different species. And then, of course, there are birds of prey that will eat um, tortoises. And the younger, the better. There's actually a problem with um, ravens that are real savvy and they they end up um, moving into where humans move in and they they start to prey on young tortoises and that's a real problem you'll often see a lot of raven nests riddled with with baby desert tortoises um coyotes of course kit foxes just anything will eat tortoises we've found um tortoise burrows that have been dug up by badgers and those are pretty fierce predators as well so I would say just any, about any predator is going to try to get a tortoise, but the tortoise has its, obviously, its defense with its shell, which is quite successful. So we, you know, you bring up ravens there, and we've talked about what would happen when the place is built, and then can you talk about the ongoing, I mean, presumably there's going to be a lot of traffic through this thing, presumably there's going to be a lot more humans, uh, a lot more machines. Can you talk about the ongoing effects? Let's pretend that it's it's up and running, and what what will what will it continue to do to harm the desert? Well, when it's in operation, there are several other impacts that that can be um, talked about. When you mentioned ravens. Um, we've visited some other solar projects after the fact after they've been built and. Although they try to mitigate it and they try to put little like spikes on the fences, we do often see ravens sitting on fences and they're as perches. And um, I'm sure they're preying on baby tortoise, but they prey on a lot of creatures. But that 
type of artificial perch that they create just by creating fences and power lines and everything else actually does create a wildlife issue. Um, you also get a subsidized predator problem when you create a really big solar project and that was what they're trying to avoid with the desert tortoises when they pace the fences but you're still going to have a lot of predators that are going to probably get savvy and learn about where the tortoises are and how they get cornered by um, new geographic human-made features that are going to be placed on that project site. Um, um, like I said before, the other solar project where they mowed the vegetation had a really bad invasive weed problem, and sometimes they even control that with herbicides, and I think that creates a, a toxic issue that, that should also be considered. Um, one of the big problems with photovoltaic projects, and this is one that there's still not a lot of data out there on, but it's one that we hear a lot of reports about, is that they kill a lot of birds. And um, that's because they mimic a lake. That they have a lake-like appearance. And um, there's some projects, like there's one south of Joshua Tree National Park called Desert Sunlight Solar, where they just find a lot of dead birds that collide with the solar panels. And many of these birds are um, water birds. Some of them are um, grebes. Um, there have been herons. Um, there's quite a number of songbirds. Um, there are biologists that have told me there are some solar projects in extreme southern California near agricultural fields where the biologists turn in buckets of dead birds a day. And so the theory is, is that they mimic lakes. And if you take a look on our website or if you take a, a drive out to the Mojave Desert and you see one of these projects from a distance, they certainly do look like big bodies of water. And they create, a lot of them, a polarized glare effect, which um, many species of birds believe they're eyes actually are um, visually um, adapted to see a polarized glare effect. So that, that's another um, big impact that could actually happen with um, all of these existing solar panels. Um, we've actually brought that issue up several times, and um, the solar industry always comes back and says, well, we don't have enough data. Um, you can't even prove that that's why birds are, are colliding with solar panels. And they've even so much as said that um, you can't even tell us that you wouldn't find that many dead birds in the desert anyway. And, well, they did a study of that. Um, the Bureau of Land Management in 2014, over a period of years, had people walk the desert and people walk the solar projects, and they found about three times as many dead birds on the project site um, as they did out in open land. Um, scavengers will pick up the bodies, but the scavengers will get into the solar project sites as well. So um, even if there's no such thing as a lake effect, it seems as though they're finding a lot of dead birds on these project sites as well. And they're building some of them near um, bodies of water or near flyways, Gemini Solar would be built near Lake Mead, that's the Colorado River, um, and it would be in between that and a large wetlands wildlife refuge called the Peronigat National Wildlife Refuge. And then there's another area not too far from there called the Las Vegas Wetlands Park. And so we're thinking that one's probably going to be a problem. And there's not a lot known about this, but it could have something to do with the types of solar panels that they install. And these guys won't even tell us that. And there are different kinds of solar panels. There's photovoltaic silicon panels, but um, there's also the very highly reflective ones, and they're called the cadmium telluride modules. 
and those are some of the panel that have had the biggest problem with burns. Um, and those are also um, using a rare earth mineral, and um, there was one solar project in Southern California that was actually hit by a tornado and several thousand of those broke open. We have to wonder, you know, what kind of toxic effects that could have over the years. And they're going to leave these out there for like 30 years or more. So I think there's a whole list of issues <laughs> um, that could be talked about after the project in operation. So we have about seven or eight minutes left, or five or six minutes, and I have a couple questions. One of them is, and I'm an opponent of solar in any case because I think the rarest mining is incredibly difficult. There's the what you just said about the, the birds. But if you're going to have solar, why put this out in the desert when you already have a bunch of parking lots? It makes no sense to me. It, why don't Why don't they just put them... On why don't they put them above a parking lot instead of instead of out in the wild? Well, and that's always been our our argument. And when you take a look at the amount of growth in Las Vegas that's happening, it's it's sad. It's sad to watch it. And there are very few solar panels going up. And I would say the answer to that is is that one company can really profit really quickly when they can get the government to essentially turn over that much land to them without you know, having to buy that property or having to zone it through a county or do anything like that. So it's really quick and dirty, and it's a, a real profiteering effort to just put it out in the desert like that, hook it all up into a transmission line. In this case, they're going to give it to the state of Nevada. In many cases, they ship it like you know, 600 miles and, and to a far off location. So, it, in a lot of cases, it doesn't even go local. So, um, so why don't they do it? I think it's just total profit-driven greed. So, we have just a couple, three minutes. Can you talk a little bit about Basin and Range Watch, and then about what people can do about this particular project and what people can do to support Basin and Range Watch in general? Well, Basin and Range Watch was a nonprofit organization, and we started it about 10 years ago, or maybe 12 years ago now, and just we were trying to get people to care about the un, un, unknown areas of the desert and try to bring attention to that because they were just being overlooked. And about that time, there was a large renewable energy boom, and that was sort of a niche that we found. And so Basin and Range Watch is, is essentially there um, to try to keep people informed about large-scale bad energy projects and specifically renewable projects. Um, as far as what people can do about the Gemini Solar Project, it's in a um, review period right now with the Bureau of Land Management, um, they've actually closed many of the official comment periods um, in September. And so they don't take your comments on an official record. But if you go on our website and you can look up Gemini Solar, you can see their address. And it's certainly OK for people to send them letters and, and give them a piece of their mind. And so what you can do for Basin and Range Watch, I'm not going to just ask for money or anything like that. I'm going to just say, um, try to be aware of large-scale renewable energy and and try to consider that as a, a very important environmental issue as well as all of the other issues that big environmental groups are fighting because we are losing thousands and thousands of acres of habitat to that very problem and there are better ways to do it there are better ways to save energy there are better ways to um, to save the desert and to save the climate we don't need to just pave it over and develop it yeah 7,000 acres is that's big that would, be, that would be an immense clear cut that is an immense clear cut it's just a clear cutting creosote bush it's the size of a lot of small towns it's even bigger than that it just for perspective it's just like 
clustering hundreds of football fields together. <laughs> well, thank you so much for raising this important issue, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Kevin Emmerich. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.